Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's your host, John Scardina. Last week, I was at the National Hurricane Conference with the Readiness Lab, the podcast network that we're associated with. You know, there's a lot of great things about this podcast network, including interviewing great leaders and people who are inspirational to us in the field. You know, working in emergency and disaster services, it's hard to pinpoint who your heroes are because everyone really sacrifices so much to be able to get the job done by putting people first. But as you know, one of my great heroes is Joe Hernandez. He's been on the podcast a couple times. In fact, we're going to play his episode today, his first episode that he was with us, because today, unfortunately, marks the anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing, which happened on April 19th. And uh, Joe was one of the responders there. In fact, urban search and rescue was a new thing for the United States. And uh, Joe was uh, leading there as helping out with medical for USAR and shared his experiences as well as so many other experiences that can really help us out in emergency management. And so we're going to cut over right now to his previous episode. Now, if you've listened to it before, uh, I would implore you to, again, listen to it now. And if it is new to you, you know, again, take that and soak it in what he has to say. Remember these tragedies that's happened in the world and make a determination that you'll do something about that to be able to prevent disasters in the future, whether they're man-made or natural. And most importantly, if you get something out of this episode, please let Joe know that. I mean, Joe's, again, one of my heroes. He's been so inspirational for so many other people. And so if you can, on social media, to say, thanks, Joe, for all you've done, or, or thank a first responder for... Um, you know, helping us out in the field, or maybe even one of your heroes, just tag them in uh, one of our posts for Disaster Tough. You know, that would mean a lot to us because today we should remember the heroes and the victims lost and not, um, you know, not evil actors. So on that note, we're going to switch over to the Joe Hernandez episode that aired with us uh, a long time ago. It's his first episode. Again, he's going to be talking about the Oklahoma City bombing experience that um, and the lessons learned from that. And uh, we'll see you for next week. Joe, welcome back to the show. Hey, how are you? Good to see you, John. It's been a great uh, start of a new year. We're hoping it'll continue this way, at least as a personal, as far <laughs> as my life is concerned, and yours too. Congratulations on uh, the birth of your new uh, daughter. Thank and, you so uh, much. Hopefully yeah. we'll leave uh, some of the 2020 behind and some of these recent incidents that we just got to witness uh, against our own uh, facilities here in this country. Yeah, it's really disheartening to think, not disheartening. Um, I, I, you know, I, I actually had a conversation. I actually had a conversation with um, a good friend of mine this morning, and he said that the feelings he felt on January 6th, because let's, let's just talk about it directly, right? January 6th, Capitol building, uh, insurrection. And uh, he said, I haven't felt that same way since uh, 9-11. Like those same kind of feelings that... Somebody attacked my country. I love my country. And you're finally hearing both sides of an aisle, political perspective, not the extremists, of course, but within that, that normal confines of saying, hey, that was wrong. Correct. And we haven't seen that since 9-11. It's just nuts. Yep. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen it on a, on a scale across the country. We've seen it a little hidden bits and pieces throughout the years coming and going just because of the different movements and protests and, and demonstrations across the country. And I'm, I'm even talking 10, 15 years ago, we were still having those little incidences and emergency managers were, were having to deal with it to a certain degree. Yeah. And that's, that's what happens anytime there's civil unrest. I mean, I, I'm, I keep telling people, stop doing the comparison. You know, I hear, you know, People are like, well, what about, you know, last nine months of the, the, the demonstrations, the protests, the riots? How is this different? And they try to excuse one action or the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you have to do is step back and say, OK, like for a single incident, you have to look at what happened at that incident, what arrests were made, why the arrests were made. But more importantly, the, the big difference for me for this one is, you know, terrorists, you know, what I would call terrorist or domestic terrorists. Uh, extremists at the minimum are calling what happened on January 6th an awakening. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they act like it's the beginning of several, uh, several things that are going to happen. And so as emergency managers, even though that, that topic gets political real fast, it doesn't matter if there are, if there's possible incidents of 
uh, terrorist activity, if there's possible incidents of even civil unrest, we have to coordinate with other agencies. We have to respond to that and keep people safe, whether if it's just a peaceful protest, keeping it a peaceful protest, or if it balloons into something else and we find pipe bombs like they found, um, how do we deal with that? So let's just jump in some of these questions because I want to use Oklahoma City, that Oklahoma City bombing, your experience as a way to help teach other emergency managers. So you've noted it's a crime scene. Can you t- tell us what that meant for you as a, a responder to that and uh, some of those lessons learned? Yeah, but- of course, the first thing that entered everybody's mind was why, um, especially when it affected uh, um, a nursery within the facility itself. You know, I understand sometimes that back. I, no, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. However, I can comprehend or at least listen to um, their backlash of lashing out in the anti-government theory for whatever reasons they have, but to yeah. implicate the other innocent bystanders, i.e., children at an event um, blows my mind. Um, And then the ramifications of everyone else, not just those, but just at the responders as well. And the effects of those uh, managers that are having to put all their resources and how are we going to do it? And we've never had that experience before. And boy, it's not a good time to start learning. And now we're learning. However, one of the pieces to a puzzle is putting them all together and Every piece is a different picture. And sometimes as a responder, as an emergency management management personnel, you need those pictures to be able to put together those puzzles on a timeline basis so that you can come back and see something maybe another individual doesn't just based on your experience and say, hey, I'm looking at something on this picture. Did you guys notice and coming back, uh, a structural engineer may see a crack in a foundation and say, you know, the mother slab that you guys tied back with the cables and cranes and was holding it and said that the workers were safe as they went inside to search really wasn't. It was just one of those theories, but it takes pictures. And unfortunately being a crime scene, those cameras, which at that time we didn't have cell phones, they just weren't readily available in 1995. Can't even imagine. (laughs) So look at the generations that are listening to the podcast. So it's really, it's ironic. And what we all carried with the Instamatics, you remember the Kodak little, uh, you know, tear open foil pack and you got 24 oh, yeah. pictures out of it. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you the were happy to click. get what you got and you maybe had two of those. And, and so the task forces and the individual shared pictures until all of a sudden it was identified of, you're not going home with any of that. We need any mm. and all of that to be able to put this, this puzzle together on our end. We did get those pictures back. I remember doing some training years after uh, in Oklahoma City, preparing them for future events and the grants and things that were going on. And what we called community integrated disaster response exercises we were doing there. And uh, it was interesting to see what went on. And now I was able to see a picture not coming home or a week later, but seeing it disasters later and seeing what was wrong in the pictures we were seeing. Yeah. And that was interesting in itself, um, a, a psychological event that I remember uh, very much was uh, our breaks. Um, it was pretty important to give the guys breaks just because of the significant impact of not only seeing that magnitude of, of death and, and destruction, but how it happened and who was involved. And uh, when you take a break, you usually go into a break room. You're, you're away from the noise. You're, you might be watching a TV. You might sit down in a lounge chair. You might pop something in the microwave. Uh, you might go out for a smoking break, whatever your break session is. And here, God bless their hearts, the guys were putting together these little wooden plywood shacks. Um, one of the task forces even put on there the Hilton. Uh, it was just one of those things. They were, it was For them, it was the Hilton. And it couldn't have been any bigger than eight by ten. And they were able to get in there, uh, sit on the floor, backs up against the wall, you know, hold their backpacks in their hands and take a few minutes. The bad thing was it was staring at the at the destruction. And so as they yeah. sat there, their minds still drifted, not in a good way, but possibly in a in a dangerous way. Real quick, we're going to pause for this week's disaster tough endorsements. 
How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue in collapsed and confined structures. This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. The Readiness Lab is trailblazing disaster readiness. Early access for the highly anticipated course, Emergency Management Response for Dynamic Populations is currently live. Think you have what it takes? Join us in Atlanta for an immersive experience. Space is limited to 40. Go to the readinesslab.com forward slash training to learn more. Okay, let's jump back in. Yeah. There's, um, I just talked to the interim director for, um, the state, the state universities of New York, the Albany. Um, and he does, he's the interim director for the emergency management program. And they're focusing a lot on, uh, what they're calling psychological first aid. Um, almost taking it like that red cross perspective of teaching the emergency managers and possible first responders who are going through their program about self care and about the care of others and um, how to do that more appropriately so that when they are faced with these traumatic events, they are traumatic. And uh, to recognize that and to, to, to have the tools necessary to be, to be safe, to have that self-care, to know what, what extreme looks like and what normal looks like. Sometimes when you see extreme, it causes you to forget like what normal is. You know, or you think always oh, extreme might happen. I've had some friends who um, kind of become hardcore doomsday preppers, you know, afraid to go out, afraid to do anything yeah. because, you know, the active shooter could happen again. And sure. we don't want people to be like that. We want to recognize that that's rare and it's, it's odd and it's, it's not part of uh, normal, you know? Correct. It's different than the stress the body feels. That stress that the body processes is, it is normal, but that experience is not. Um, in fact, man, I want to read this to you before I forget. Sure. Had a, after your episode aired, I was going to wait a little bit longer, but I really want to share this with you now because um, what you're talking about is um, really important to a lot of people and your experience in that is really important. So I'm just going to pull this up. Uh, give me 10 seconds. Sure. Kind of weird to do on a podcast, but... Um, <laughs> Let's see. Oh, okay, here we go. Joe Hernandez. You ready for this? Joe yes. Hernandez is one of my EM heroes. In a different life, I would have uh, been an FDNY firefighter and a medical rescue specialist on their USAR team. He is also... He, he, so he and his two-part special was particularly awesome to hear. So I just want to like... I'll let you know that there's people who are in our listeners who are calling you their hero. And, um, that response alone, I mean, set you up and then, you know, her, she's talking about nine 11. And, um, so how do you process that? How do you process that as a responder? Um, knowing that you have so much to offer other people through your experiences. Are you glad that you had those experiences to offer or, are you, are you now focusing on training other people to not have to have those experiences? The first one. I, I, absolutely. I, I wish there was more time. Um, I wish we weren't getting older so fast. Um, the, the, the irony is the distance between disasters and the changes in generations and sometimes missing that. And we hope and that that change continues, but it looks like that guard that's following in our footsteps is right behind it. Uh, I've been now retired from the department for going on 10 years, um, training, still delivering, still teaching all those that are active. The instructors who are active and teaching, one of them just retired last night from FDNY. Uh, oh, wow. One of the responders to uh, Ground Zero. 
who uh, has been a best friend and one of the business partners uh, in the uh, education business. And so hats off to Vinnie Johnson for his retirement with FDNY and special operations as a rescue medic and instructor um, for that. And, and the, the rest of them will be there in the next few years. I just spoke uh, real, to a real good friend. Uh, he's a task force leader out of Orlando, city of Orlando, mm. Florida task force four. He's very familiar with the uh, Reedy Creek which is your Walt Disney World uh, complex. And you can imagine what goes on there on a daily basis with yeah, a threat terribly. of domestic terrorism. Uh, and he just hit his 25th year on the department and, and uh, it doesn't have much gray hair, so it's really not fair. Um, so it's good <laughs> to see the next generation. And I can't say enough. I know that every time I am able to be part of delivering a course, we make it as easy as possible to put as many as we can and tweaking and saying, ah, you know what, we've got a couple scholarship positions available or mm -hmm. I'll just send two and just pay for one. If you got to do that, be just because of the desire to be there, even someone to say that I'm not part of a, a, a USAR task force yet. However, I'm longing to be there. They won't send me yet because I'm new on the department, but I really want to go. And mm -hmm. so what do you say to a young person that way? that has that desire and you know what i can do it because i i run the ship there so I can that's say, awesome you know you know what guys and you ask the instructors how they feel and and hands down every one of them say bring them on that's awesome yeah uh, yeah i did an active shooter awareness training for our community here and there was a lot of people we, we charged for that just basically you know basically covering the bills kind of thing and uh i would say I probably should, this is bad business practice, but I, uh, I am giving most of it away because most people who wanted to come couldn't afford it. And I was just like, just come. Like, I'd rather you just have the, the information and uh, ate that cost. Yeah. Uh, but before we uh, talk about your business, uh, talking about the retirees, yes. um, here, we'll give an applause for them. There we go. I love these pre pre recorded buttons, um, uh, Vinny and all them. So, Let's go back to real quick for, first your business. And then let's talk about some of the, if you're talking about domestic terrorism in your business, let's talk about that. So you actually run two businesses. If I recall, you run, let me look this up. You run disaster medical solutions and you also run solid responder. So uh, let's talk about that. And what are the differences between the two? And then um, let's pair it back to this conversation. Sure. Um, Disaster Medical Solutions, uh, we started uh, over just over 10 years out of a desire from agencies across the country that weren't able to get the education that the federal government was able to deliver at that time, the limited amount. Um, and then just to a few, um, it, it was the demand was there. And so we launched that with uh, instructors from all over the country, from East Coast, Central Division, and West Coast, uh, paramedics, physicians, firefighters, and uh, veterinarians to uh, train the next persons that are the medical specialists and the medical team managers that support the urban search and rescue environment or the search and rescue teams, i.e. Cool. every large team, every big large type one team that goes out carries two physicians and four paramedics, et cetera. And so it's training them exactly in the field of uh, what they're going to see and feel and uh, smell. And, and uh, sometimes you find out that they don't like the medicine within that confined space, rubble, not a lot of room to move. They had to crawl for a long time. It's dark, it's dusty, can't really move around, can't see real well. And, you know, as some of the guys joke around, maybe their brother or sister locked them in a closet when they were young playing games and <laughs> he ain't getting that closet anymore. So. Uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah that's cool it's, though. That's um, puts them in a different environment. Yeah. The, the most, like I said, I think I brought this up in the last time we talked, the most USAR training I had was um, at the, the fire service college in the UK. Sure. And they have a campus there and um, man, I don't like confined spaces. Yeah. You know, I, I'm so I focus really hard on the mitigation piece. Like Doberman focuses a lot of, of training as well, but we don't sure. deal with that at all. We deal with much more mitigation and um, um, the emergency management strategic level and training populations how to deal with disaster. So 
I think there's actually a win here if um, maybe we should talk offline about how we can help each other out because absolutely I've been putting, collide for sure. putting putting the emergency managers just in that environment, um, bringing them through, letting them see a class, which I've always welcomed, um, opens their eyes and complexity of saying, you know what, I didn't know that they wouldn't just go in and grab the person and put the piece of concrete off them and bring them out and take them to the hospital as fast as possible. I had no idea that medical people were going to go in there and stay in there for hours and medically treat this person, trying to get them back to their pre trap status. Sometimes to the event, i.e. In, in Haiti, et cetera, is performing an amputation in the field. Uh, so right. it's not taught in a classroom, basically. It's just uh, something that exists. So th- that emergency manager, seeing that environment and then running with a, a live exercise at the end, put some things in perspective for them to say, uh, you know, we do need a certain type of individual. We do need to make sure that things are safe when they get here. And then how am I going to make things better for the community that's out here? Cause you know that everybody that has someone in that building and or that area that has been compromised wants to know. And since you're in charge, you're the one that's going to have to answer those questions. And so what do I bring for them? What kind of yeah. comfort levels, et cetera. That's fascinating to think about. I remember you talking about um, feeding in the water bottle and feeding things through the water bottle to that little girl in the in the grocery store that it, it crushed. So this, this is wild. Since then, we uh, we actually uh, created a uh, transport pod, and we call it the Survivor Pod. It's uh, twelve inches long. It's uh, open with one hand. Mm. We saw the victims having trouble with tape, so they can actually squeeze it and it pops open. Put more items inside of it, i.e., a light stick, etc has a little hanging component so you can bring it down with a rope Drop or down. a carabiner. So that's cool. just things to help out those that are either responding and trying to help those that are in the need of response. If you have a link for that, I would be happy to put that on our website and just have sure. people link directly to it for you. So, sure. um, so how is that different than solid responder? Well, solid responder went away from the education. We had, uh, we've been doing a lot of research and development for the last 10 years for companies that were trying to bring in new products that were going to make our lives and the person that needed rescues life better, uh, i.e. cameras, i.e. patient monitoring devices, uh, lifting devices, securing devices, but all that can stand and withstand the confined space uh, drop and it's still going to work. Um, hey, listen, I don't have a repeater up. Uh, is it still going to get the signal out? Um, I don't have a lot of room, but but I need to assess this patient. How much information can I really get out of a monitor? Will it work? And year after year, training all the different agencies from the FEMA and state agencies and FBI and military, et cetera, and all the, the ones going through the classes, the res- desire and the response now from all of them was back is, why aren't you putting those products out in the open and offering them out there from the manufacturers putting them together? And so we handpicked about four items um, in particular, just because it makes that response there. We don't want, uh, you know, 15 pages in a catalog and item number four products. And we feel very good. The fifth one I think we're going to add is a little controversial. And that would be the field amputation blades. <laughs> Interesting. And a, and a, what, a, the, and a, what does and a, a field a, amputation <laughs> blade look like? It's uh, 12 inches long, made out of stainless steel. It has gone under engineering um, for the position of the sawtooth, uh-huh. uh, the size of the sawtooth, uh-huh. and it has gone through the bioskill labs uh, used on cadavers up at Long Island Jewish uh, Hospital, the Northwell um, folks, uh-huh. several years, uh, probably about five years in a row. Every surgeon that had used them understood the need for something to be able to be out there in the field, i.e. them not being available and those tools not being available. And 99.9% of those surgeons, I would say over 50 of them, all approved of it. Mm. One had a little issue with it and he had trouble cutting with it. And our first question was, has he ever used a wood saw to cut a piece of wood? And he hadn't. And no, you know, things to him, but this blade is more towards the size of a wood blade. And so it it binds. If you don't let the saw do its work where you're trying to do the work of the saw. And so other than that, it worked fine. Um, We 
lessons learned from some collapses that have happened over the last 10 years. We started coming back from Haiti and understanding that a, uh, an amputation that was completed because of the uh, survivability of that victim was crashing. And so a decision had to be made at that time. And a regular skill saw blade was used. Um, there was no time, no room, except it was about nine inches to be able to work in that environment. And uh, we didn't want the patient to pass. And so the decision was made to use a crude tool and that victim uh, lives very well here in the United States. And so coming back here to this country and, and trying to approach the blade manufacturers and, you know, the, the attorneys don't want anything to hear about it. And it's la, 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 la out in the field and trying to find someone who would listen to us. And uh, would the short blade be better as opposed to the long blade? And how are we able to get in there? And so uh, it's part of the course. Part of the course is teaching field amputations. And uh, mm. if we can't get uh, cadavers to be able to complete that uh, part of the course, we'll go ahead and use uh, um, pork and or goats, uh, depending on the tissue. Uh, not live tissue. And so for the listeners not to get excited, <laughs> call PETA on us and say you're using live tissue. No, that's not uh, in the USAR training, but at least to get the practitioners, i.e. The, the physicians. And a lot of them said, you know, what are you guys doing that out in the field? These guys really can't perform that in the field um, legally. And uh, mm -hmm. who are they going to bring in at the time when the victim is under the rubble and trapped um, in an area where, as you spoke about, it's been two or three days of eviscerations and the need is there to remove that victim. Um, and Fascinating. Also, to uh, dismember possibly someone to get to that victim. And that it's always a, a compromise as well. Um, so we were going to be talking about domestic terrorism and all of our listeners are like trying not to throw up right now, which is awesome. Uh, this is the field though. This is, this is what it is. Yes. And I think it's important to understand that uh, emergency managers often obviously sit behind the scenes and first responders don't get to see that, that coordination sometimes. But what you're talking about is, um, hey, you just said, you just brought up a really important word. You said legal, and there are legal implications to what we do, and um, a lot of the people behind the scenes they work with those policymakers to make those legal actions, and so that is a really good call out for that. And uh, that's awesome about your businesses. I we also have a mutual connection, Matt, with uh, First Alert. Um, they created a 360 camera. I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I keep on telling him we should sponsor the show, Matt. But uh, until he does, I'll be a friend and I'll say, hey, you should, uh, people should, if you do search and rescue, or you're a firefighter and you're looking for a camera to get into tight spaces, uh, definitely check him out. I can even put it in the show notes. Um, but that's, that's really cool, the things that you're doing. And again, our worlds touch so close together. They are technically different. Um, but, you know, I'd be happy to talk to you offline about more about that. Absolutely. So let's, let's get it back into our meat of our conversation because uh, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of emergency managers, especially, are focusing on uh, domestic terrorism and the possibility for uh, you know for um, a, maybe even a black swan. What I would sure. call a black swan is, for, for example, if we're talking about the inauguration, if everybody's focusing on Washington, who's focusing on another part of the country? Absolutely. And. Um, I, I kind of want to ask you about that because there has been several events and what I would call, you know, not what I would call, there are several t terrorist attacks that have impacted emergency management and response and how we do operate. So obviously Oklahoma city bombing was a big one, uh, 9-11, duh. But there's also seven, the seven, seven attacks in UK. A lot of people in the U S don't study that, but they really should. And then the Paris attacks a couple years ago, um, that coordinated attack because it was a multi-location attack as well. And so I just, and that's just terrorism, right? There's, there's even the, the natural events, right? If everybody's focused on the earthquake in, on Cascadia, what happens when an, uh, a hurricane pops up on, in, in the, on the East Coast? So from your perspective, a guy who's been to a lot of these events, who gets told, hey, you're, you're deploying into a crime scene or you're deploying into this mass casualty event, what have you done in the past to protect you and your team against cascading events? Good question. And yeah. And how do you make sure that other people still can focus yeah. on their jobs of, of that too? 
especially with social media as it is today. And uh, FEMA now is the lead agency for consequence management. God forbid something does happen. And uh, Mm -hmm. you did bring up the Midwest and and in between the Midwest and the far West, we've got a lot of states out there that uh, people consider rural uh, unimportant. And you know what? That's exactly uh, what the domestic terrorists look for is a target that's going to take a long time for resources to get out there. And in the meantime, the mayhem that's created by that. Um, And so uh, to keep people safe, you know, um, the incident that happened in Waco uh, woke some of us up in the. uh, You're talking about the facility that blew up? And the uh, during the uh, Divinian uh, um, ATF uh, explosion that Uh, happened, the 1993. Um, Uh You were a young man back then. (laughs) <laughs> um, it was, but I looked that better back kind of, then too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That opened up a lot of eyes to response and deployment because unintentionally the ambulance strike team that was headed there, um, dispatched for those that would possibly be injured, not only the government workers, also the civilians that were in there, there were a lot of ambulances coming, as you know, AMR gets sent up and they'll send a strike team of, you know, 25, 50 ambulances with no problem. On their way there, they were asking, needing to ask for directions. Remember, no GPS at this time. I mean, we were really in the early days of response. Um, saw a, a postal worker, a U.S. government dressed um, postal worker in a marked vehicle and stopped to ask for directions to the compound. Um, that person being a member of that compound saw the strike team and then alerted them to not knowing what was going on, but somebody was asking for directions and this is, this is who they were. And so it, it alerted them. And so IE us going to uh, the Oklahoma city bombing or going to any event, IE we've been doing uh, uh, RNCs and DNCs, uh, Republican national conventions, democratic national conventions, uh, inaugurations, anytime that there's a national security event, they'll activate and deploy several uh, urban search and rescue teams for consequent management. We did it for the Atlanta Olympics and we did it for the Salt Lake City Olympics as well. Um, and the last thing we need is for someone to get on the phone and say, hey, honey, this is where we're at tonight. We're staying at the Cobb County Fairground outside of Atlanta. And you know what? If something bad happens, we're going to fly in with Black Hawk helicopters because we won't be able to drive in. And so now I'm letting her know how we're doing things. And we've got the national pharmaceutical stockpile here. And what's that telling her? You know, why are they there? You know, and, and so why do we need to put this information out and, and careful because we want to involve our significant others. uh, But at the same time, it's a, security problem and at the same time are we imposing a psychological episode that they're not meant to handle we are we just don't understand call out we don't understand it but hey honey you know i've come home with the boy stuff and la 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 you know you know grow up get thick skin no that's (laughs) not the way that we're supposed to treat them and or our kids uh, when they come down you know even my own kids the, the pictures that you saw after ground zero of you know, people jumping out of buildings. Well, that's significant. Um, right. And so it well, trickles down. People who want to be in this field, who think they can handle it, not that doesn't always work out, but, but for the most part, people prepare for that. My wife is a phenomenal graphic designer. She has designed Academy Awards. She's done Ruth Carlton rebranding. She's had some like really, really big products. She's even did this, the sign. Hey, the best podcast out there. Yeah, right. So she, she's a really good des- graphic designer. She got into graphic design because she loves the way the world looks. And she, she wants to make the world look beautiful. I came home from my first active assailant event. And um, I was three months into a new job. And I told her about it. And um, that was like the biggest dumb idea I've ever done. One of my big dumb ideas. It really impacted her. She was worried about me. She was worried about like future. She was just, she did not sign up to be an emergency response. She, she wanted to, she would have done that. And, um, she ch- chose to focus on the beauty of the world. And I decided to focus on the destruction of the world. <laughs> and, um, I think it's okay. So after that event, 
uh, I've never told her any, any other really intense event that I've been, in, I've been involved in, yeah. but that doesn't mean I haven't talked to anybody. Like I still talk to like my right. buddies in the field and, and go right. through that, but you're right. It is a security issue. And now it's a security issue with social media. I'm sorry. There's stupid people out there. And yeah. when your buddy calls home to his spouse or his friend and that friend's like, Oh my gosh, man, my friend is so cool. They, Joe Hernandez is a hero. He's got these black Hawks and he's at this location. Yeah. And then like it spirals or somebody else can hear it. Right. Somebody else is an earshot, uh, you know, that maintenance worker or even somebody else that that's, uh, you know, facilitating around that area and um, they start realizing what's, what's going on. They say it at a gas station. This is a really dumb one. A lot of people talk at gas stations when they're filling up their gas, to the, you know, back home. So that was a really good call out to like be situation to have situational awareness of the detail that you share and who you share to, not just for domestic terrorism or terrorism in general, but also for the health and safety of those in your life. Yep. We yeah. even had a domestic terrorism slide into the stations and unknowingly um, the city of Miami holding one of the, the wow events, uh, those national events that did a lot of car burning and building burning in Washington back in the nineties and, Mm -hmm. They did one there and, and it's more just to stop operations, you know, stop traffic, stop anything you can. And uh, they slid into the fire station as the company was pulling out and the doors were going down, they slid in and they made it into the attic. And in the attic, they were setting up a repeater to be able to intercept the fire department's transmission oh, yeah. so that they would know where they were going, when and how. One of the guys who had insomnia at night, couldn't go to sleep after a call, heard him in the attic. And of course, you've got 12 people in there, you know, maybe 10 guys and two females, and they want to rumble somebody up. That can up. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> no. And they were just part of that operation, you know, the, the confiscated uh, things that they had brought up there and they were um, ping pong balls, uh, with, they were going to fill with muriatic acid and pool balls with slingshots to shoot and just anything to create. We don't want to give them too many ideas on the show. No. Either, yeah. Oh, they, and they've <laughs> been there for so long. And it's it, yeah. every time you think that you have learned something new that they may create, you're, you're surprised to find out something new that they've come up with. And it's like, Oh my goodness. Now how are we going to yeah. get them out of that? Right. There is a, uh... Before uh, a previous job, I had to read the security threats and um, read the propaganda that was being pushed out by terrorist organizations. And I'm a competent guy. I get it. And I know what's going on. And they try to manipulate people so much by they, they attach one, one, one truth and then they lie about all the other stuff and it becomes manipulative. And so you see a lot of these domestic terrorist people uh, I keep on saying domestic terrorists because that's what we're talking about, but people who want to hurt other people and then they get interviewed if they get captured and you're like, you know, that's all BS, right? Like, but they don't know. And they start to really feed into these conspiracies because they hear one thing that's true. And so everything else must be true too. And that, that inherently is an evil way to, to, to operate. Yeah. And so, um, I don't care about people's political feelings, uh, like it, they can sway one way or the other. My thing is as a responder, as an emergency manager and looking at data, how people take that information and twist that information and use that information, uh, where essentially it's destroying the truth and just creating propaganda, evil propaganda. Um, you can't deny the actions that have, has that happened and what may happen. And so, um, man, you're just, you're just, ringing all bells with me right now for, for what we need to be addressing. And everything that comes to play for emergency managers. I, I mean, I, uh, 1996, we went to a building explosion in Puerto Rico, uh, Humberto Vidal building in Rio Piedra, um, two task forces deployed there and every agency, I didn't know there were that many agencies with that many acronym, uh, national transportation <laughs> safety bureau. Why were they there? Cause they didn't know if it was a gas explosion. And gas travels through a pipeline. And so it's transportation. I'm like, there's so many agencies here and they all, they, emergency management has to be going nuts on who's here, 
Where are my liaisons? How am I going to break them all up? Where are they going to stay? How am I going to take care of them? What about the aftermaths once they go? And I got to be careful what they say while they're here because they could really ruin or hurt our economy and our everything else that's going on within our small town or large town, et cetera. Yeah. So what do you do then? Like, let's, let's talk, let's talk about that scenario or let's, let's talk about maybe even the inauguration that's coming up. Um, to be able to protect you both, you have the security issue of the people who are there and then what they might say, but you also need to protect against black swans. And we've given that high level of like, okay, you need to be aware of that. But what do you actually do? What is Joe Hernandez's advice to those in the field right now? What would you tell them to do right now? The ones that are deploying? Yeah. The ones that are getting ready to go? Stay quiet. Wait for the event to happen. Don't create a, a, another hearsay. Um, treat it as you would coming into your own family, not knowing if one of your family members was going to do something different or not. Uh, think of it as your wedding. You know how things go crazy in your wedding. But just be aware that uh, at any moment's notice, it could be happy, sad, or it could really, really change to a drastic degree. But there's so many inputs. As you said, think about those folks that are there in that response arena and they're isolated and they've got nothing else to do but talk. And the first thing that comes up is either politics or religion. And so yeah, <laughs> take off the yeah. boxing gloves, you know? Please don't, yeah, and please don't bring up weddings because my wedding, oh my gosh, I'm going to get so much flack from this for my wife. My wedding was awful. There was so much stupid drama that like all that, remember how we're talking about one thing of truth and all the other lies? There was yeah. a lot of that going on. And I remember, like, I just want to get over this. Like, I just want to get through this. I want to get beyond this. All that other drama stuff's going to go away. People will see reality. Yep. And my wife, you know, my wife is going to really beat me up for this. I love everybody. <laughs> I'm happy with everybody. <laughs> but, oh, my gosh, man, I never want to get married again. She better never leave me because that was the worst. I'm not doing it um, again. Yeah. But even within our own responders, we've got, you know, individuals that, see differently. And, and that's why we're calling it, you know, domestic terrorism as opposed to international terrorism, because it's right within our own backyard. Yes. Um, one of my station that I was at for a period of time was uh, just on the, uh, the outskirts of Miami International Airport. And so when the president would come into that area, depending if he would go north, south, east or west, those fire stations and rescue units would be in that procession. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, to clear that area, you'd have Secret Service members in those facilities. Well, one of the guys didn't like that pre presidential candidate's family and decided he was going to be verbal about it. Bad idea. Terrible idea. You, you, you present a threat, a yeah, threat yeah. in a verbal state. But I didn't say anything. Y you did just by making a verbal comment. And so it's not the time or the place. You're there as a responder, um, being neutral. Um, I love that. I, I, I heard it the best and, and, I remember I was, I was raised and came from a communist nation. So my values are, you know, all outside in different areas, but raising a West pointer and having him uh, for a period of time being POTUS's platoon leader um, and commander at the old troops at the old guard, he was the commander for the transition of the department of defense as they called to order for Obama being inaugurated and whether he was a fan or not, he was proud to serve in his position, no matter who the politics were. And it was breathtaking to hear that from someone to do their responsibilities and do them properly just because that's what we've been asked to do. And sometimes yep. we don't like it. Sometimes we may not agree with it, but let's just do it to the best of our ability and let's show how well it can be done on a nonpartisan basis. I, I love that a hundred percent. I keep on telling myself I'm, I'm apolitical and, I am to a degree, obviously I get really close of like, but I get annoyed with everybody. I love everybody, but I get annoyed with everybody. Yeah. And, um, I, I agree with that hundred percent when I was in FEMA, especially. And, uh, when I was like a federal response guy in DC, uh, I never, ever, ever shared my opinion on what was happening with politics. One, because you're there to support now you've sworn allegiance to the government. You sworn allegiance to the, the Constitution, and you're there to support the president. And that's just part of the job, one. Yeah. And two, 
as soon as you make a statement like that, you've put yourself with one group or another group. And sometimes that can feel really nice. So I found my, my crowd, but that's not why you're there. You're there. Yeah. To support you're there to, as a responder, you're there as a support system. And I never did that. And even now when I work in the private sector, it's not a political move for me to talk about it. It's not a political move. I just had a, simply address the problem. And that problem, the reason why we're talking about the inauguration in, in, in January 6th, it's not because I have one political opinion or the other. I'm talking about the straight facts. The sure. facts are the flag of the enemy of the United States, the Confederate flag and the Nazi flag were inside our U.S. Capitol for the first time in U.S. history. Two cops are dead. And what does that mean? Six people in total died. What does that mean? From a data standpoint, you have to look and you have to understand like what is going on. So for those listeners out there who might be like kind of irked that like their one candidate might be addressed or their, uh, the, uh, their, their guy or their girl is, might be uh, attacked, it doesn't matter. What matters is like the actual event and how to protect people's lives, everybody's lives, even if they have a different opinion than you. Yeah, that was, that was a really good call out you made there. Thank you. So, yeah, um, this has been kind of a cool episode to address uh, the security aspect of emergency management. We talk about protection. Um, sometimes that protection needs to be protecting ourselves. Sometimes it means, means protecting our families. Absolutely. Uh, I, yeah. I, one of the task forces, ironically, um, they had had the rumor of shots being fired during Katrina, i.e., Half of the country's responding agencies went to New Orleans. Half of the response agencies went to Mississippi, where uh, the uh, eye of the storm hit in Gulfport. And yeah. um, because of the rumors that were going on of shots being fired at responders, um, one of the task forces decided uh, members on their own, without the authorities of that task force knowing they were going to carry in their bags. And so when they got there, the the, the leaders of the agency realized there were guys with duffel bags and backpacks with weapons and they were loaded. Bad and that move. was like bad move, not a place for it. Um, it took a little bit of political movement uh, to keep them still active and involved and, and not kicked out of the system for such a move that could have been drastic based on, well, when are you going to use it and why? And the only reason it was, it was kind of a domestic terrorism on us in that, we were going into the homes that were flooded. And so the water rose about eight feet in 10 minutes in the middle of the night. And so right. you're sleeping and all of a sudden you feel water in your bed and you're wondering, honey, did you pee or what's going <laughs> on? You know? yeah. and, and you've got water halfway to your door. And so the folks that, that were selling illicit contraband, um, i.e. drugs, uh, left those drugs and their money stashes in those homes. And left. Mm. So when the water receded and the first uniform personnel there were rescue workers, well, they would think everybody's law enforcement and we didn't carry any weapons and we were there to help. And so they figured that we were there to take their contraband, et cetera. And so that's where the domestic situations went. And so the teams just retreated until they were able to get law enforcement and, and that got straightened out after a little while. But, uh, it was interesting nope. seeing it from your own end and going, why are they doing that to us? We're just here to help. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, hey, pump the brakes here. Let me go. Yeah. So um, you bring up another excellent point about knowing your role. If you think there's a security risk, that doesn't mean you're the guy to take care of that security risk. Um, yeah. Here's, a, here's one thing that people don't like to hear, but it's really important to say or to know. It's, sometimes it's not about you. Sometimes you are being put in a dangerous situation and that's a threat to your, to your life. Okay. You know, you got in this field because you wanted to help out survivors. Sometimes survivors are frantic. Sometimes, sometimes survivors aren't thinking clearly. They've just been tr through trauma. And so it is a little bit of a risk to put that yourself. And so you have to do everything to mitigate that properly, having teams, having good comms, having all this stuff awareness, but, you know, going into the field to help out survivors with a loaded gun, and that's just a recipe for dumb. You know, like that's just, that's how you, that's how something bad happens. Um, 
it's just like, okay, talking about facts again, it's just like showing up at somebody's protest saying, I don't like what they're protesting with a loaded gun. Something's bound to happen. My dad would always famously say, my dad was a marksman in the army and, um, you know, having guns. And um, I asked him one time, oh, why don't you carry a gun in the glove compartment? You know, we kind of grew up in a, a little bit of a rough area and we'd cross through rough areas every once in a while. And my dad would always say, I never want to use it or I'd be afraid to use it. And I think that's a uh, really wise counsel, actually. Um, he'd always make that joke, but it was, it was actually pretty serious. And I, I think emergency managers, first responders need to think about that. It's the reason why um, we're addressing if right now in our field, if firefighters should carry a weapon or, or not. There's actually some some really big pros with that. Uh, you know? I, I, it's, it's very true. Very, very truthful. Uh, the irony, I bought this house from a gentleman who retired two years before I even came on the department. He retired in 1984. Whoa. And I found paperwork in, in one of the old desks, and it was about him and the rest of the guys wanting to bring weapons to their fire station. And that was shortly after the riots in downtown Miami. Um, yeah. And it was uh, very like, interesting. Like I said, it's complex. It, there's, there's pros for firefighters to want to carry. Should the medical personnel, when you're responding to an active shooter, should a medical personnel who is accompanying law enforcement carry a weapon? Like that's, that's a question people have right now. And we're, we're not probably not going to answer that on our show. And I'm sure you and I both have our opinions on that, but like, those are the questions that are, are being asked. Right. There is a place for, for the SWAT medic. There is a place for the medically trained person to be involved with the SWAT unit. I E yeah. I was able to do that as opposed to the police officer and, or the law enforcement officer who gets trained as a paramedic but doesn't have the honed skills and at that level of time and the action, what's his first reaction to defend or to treat. And so there goes the component. Um, I love that. Is, what's your first reaction to defend or to, to treat? To treat. And so I love that. That's a great one. You know, it, 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 mine is to treat. And so put us, put us in the back give us something to protect ourselves. Um, don't give us a perimeter to take care of, but just make sure that we're taken care of in the perimeter and it's working. I think the three tier system, uh, i.e., a lot of my friends uh, uh, were there during the uh, the Broward County response during the Parkland shootings. Um, Got it. And the consequences that went on there, the after actions, the Monday morning quarterbacks that went on there, et cetera. Yeah. And so it's become pretty uh, strong here, the three tiered uh, evolution of where law enforcement and directly immediately behind them is fire and then EMS um, because that shooter is already passed is already in another area statistically and uh, mm -hmm. what they're able to accomplish. And it's been very successful, I believe. And we have, we've had no consequences with that three tier system that the uh, international fire chiefs association was able to, to come up with and came instrumental mm -hmm. from the Arlington fire department and their SWAT medical director. So um, it, it works. Um, but it needs to be in a secured area and it needs to be in a controlled environment, not just any environment, as you said, the lone wolf carrying a weapon out there uh, and or the lone person saying I can treat anything and it really doesn't matter what I can do, um, have no, per no area or no being in, in that response field. I love asking about like um, basically the, around these questions to I have a good friend who's uh, all pro the other side and everybody should be carrying a weapon. And I love talking to you because you're like, Hey, what's your mission? Treat first or defend first. And to hear those different perspectives, like I said, I, I think there's pros and cons to both. And uh, just to have you on here to, to talk to you about that. And I, I, I agree with so many things that you're saying right now. Um, you know, and, and I think that that area is going to be gray for a really long time and it's going to become more gray um, as people decide to um, sway one way or the other. And it's, it's going to be this, um, there's going to be a difference in opinion. And I think our field really needs to address that now instead of 10 years when half the departments require a carrying weapon and half of them don't and yes. how to get a job uh, across the field. So really great call outs. Um, man, so 
again, Joe, thank you so much for coming onto our show. It's always a pleasure. Um, it's always a good time because we're able to talk about real world, real world with like, with a guy who, as our, as our, um, listeners note, as I note is a hero, your hero to me. And, um, you have to know that. And, uh, again, thank you so much for those who want to hear more about Joe's businesses. Again, Joe, what's the name of your two businesses? Disaster medical solutions.com and solid responder.com. Perfect. So again, Joe, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, for all those who want to follow him, make sure you check that out for, for those uh, businesses. Work with him for urban search and rescue or those supplies that you may need. And if you need to work with Doberman on that pre-planning and you need to, to coordinate those two fields, then Joe and I will definitely work together. You can reach out to us on our Instagram page to talk to Joe directly. That's uh, Disaster Tough Podcast. Or you can send us an email. We get so many people who send us emails. Follow us on Instagram. We have 15,000 of you downloading our episodes, but you need to start following us on Instagram. You can also check out this episode now. It's going to be on YouTube, so you can see what Joe looks like. You can hear that conversation from that angle. So you can go over to the Doberman Emergency Management page or channel on, on YouTube to check that out. But again, if you want to work with us, you have a question, you want to follow up with Joe somehow, you can always send us an e email as well. That's info at DobermanEMG.com. Again, that's info at DobermanEMG.com. 